quote the scripture many times, in the last days perilous times shall come. We are certainly in perilous times. And <clears throat> think you can think of a few things. We have had 2,000 years of grace and light and truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We've had in our era of time, let's say that last 2,000 years, you know, more light than any men have ever had. Many prophets and kings and priests and wise men desired to see the things we, saw, we see and had, did not see them. Uh, things have been revealed to us not like it was revealed unto those of men of old, like Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. They had little dreams and little pictures and they saw darkly. I mean, it's, to a certain extent we see darkly through a glass, but we have the revelation of the eternal purpose of God which they did not have. So more has been given to us. To whom much is given, <clears throat> much is required. So I've said at different times in preaching, uh, <clears throat> We've had 2,000 years of grace, and what has the result been? The most wicked generation on the face of the whole earth. <laughs> Seven times worse. What does that tell you about how mankind has responded to and handled grace and truth? So you see, the, the transgression of our generation is a transgression against grace and truth that has come to us. It's a very, you know, it's a very bad indictment against us. But anyway, we know the book of um, Isaiah, and we've read this a number of times. I've referred to it recently too. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are, are corruptors. Uh, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger, they are gone away backwards, why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. This is our condition. From the sole of the foot of, even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. So you understand Isaiah, the word of the Lord through Isaiah is calling God's people Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. That's what we become. The spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah is in the church. To what purpose is your multitude of your sacrifices? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and fat, fat fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. And he goes on. And I, I don't want to read the whole thing. But, you know, we talked about the state of being wounded and how the, the whole, from the feet to the head, is, is not sound, and that makes for a perilous situation. And so I, I think it's time, I feel like it's time to re, re, review. Every once in a while I preach on the wounds and healing vision that we heard on the Overcomer broadcast many, many years ago. Somehow it never got um, retained in the archives, so they don't have it in the archives anymore. But uh, I took it upon myself to to make a recording of it, and I've taught on it from time to time, and it's become a kind of a launching pad to talk about wounds and the state of the church. So this time, i just like to actually read through the vision. So if you'd be patient, I'm just going to read through the vision, and then we'll make comments on it, and that's about, about it. And it will relate to what we've been talking about in the past, um, about the setting of hopes, disillusionment, bitterness, Bitterness becomes wounds and rejection and, and all of that stuff, and that becomes the foundation or, uh, and the bond to iniquity and the state of being wounded. And yeah, God's people need healing, but we don't need a slight healing, but we do need healing. But anyway, let me read the uh, um, vision in its entirety. It's not that long. So all over America... And all throughout the world, you can hear the crying 
and the groaning of the wounded sheep, the people of God. Wounded, bruised, disillusioned, fearful, doubting, doubtful, uncertain, everywhere, in every place. That's the Isaiah 1 condition. The whole, from the head, the head to the foot. There's no soundness in the body. For months now I have been feeling a grieving in my spirit. That's the uneasiness that everybody is talking about that's in, in your stomach and in your spirit. So hear this person saying this. For months now I have been feeling a grieving in my spirit. I sense that this was a grieving in the heart of Jesus himself. Immediately upon my discerning this I had a vision where certain saints who were sitting in a church service changed into sheep. These sheep appeared fine when I first saw them then it was as if I were able to gaze straight inside of them. So here are sheep that on the outward appearance look like they're okay. All right, but uh, then this sister was able to gaze inside of them. At first, I recoiled at what I was seeing. What I saw was hidden wounds. Some of these wounds had developed layers of scar tissue over them, but beneath the scar tissue, the wounds were still open and fresh. Some of the wounds were in the process of being healed. Other wounds were infected. I drew back from witnessing this vision. I sensed tremendous pain, weariness, discouragement, and despair. Within the wounded hearts of these people, the pain I was sensing was breaking my heart. I ran from this vision for a time, not wanting to experience it any further. The Lord waited until I came to Him and repented of drawing back from this vision. Then the vision continued. I saw the people in a church service who had changed into sheep with hidden wounds beginning to cry out. Their cries were annoying to others in the congregation. The people I saw as sheep were a frustration to the rest of the congregation. Those wounded sheep were disruptive. At times their cries and their behavior became almost bizarre. Those wounded sheep began to withdraw themselves or be separated by others in the congregation. Remember I was talking last week about being wounded and going into a self-protecting mode. You begin to separate yourself. And of course that's the strategy of Satan, the wolf. Go into the pack and get a sheep and try to get the sheep to separate. Either they separate the sheep or they try to get the sheep themselves to cast off and separate a sheep or they just wait till the sheep, you know, goes off by itself to whatever. You know how a dog does it? Dogs go, and I'm not trying to call sheep dogs, but if you're looking at animals, dogs will withdraw themselves when they're wounded and they'll lick their own wounds. But there's a separation there that we have to be aware of. That's a strategy of Satan. Okay, so when this occurred, their behavior became even more disruptive. Okay, these wounded sheep began to withdraw themselves or to be separated by others in the congregation. When this occurred, their behavior became even more disruptive, frustrating, annoying, and confusing. The cries of the wounded sheep didn't appear to be heard by many in the congregation. Those in the congregation who did hear the cries either felt unable to help or they were angry and annoyed by their cries. Hmm. The wounded sheep began to withdraw themselves even more because of this. Then they began to wander away from the fold and from the congregation. I watched as those wounded sheep left the congregation, left the fold, left the church building they had been in. I became aware that the Lord was standing beside me. I looked at him. I saw a terrible grief and sadness in his eyes. I also saw anger. Come, he said, the Lord spoke to me. Together the Lord and I began to follow the sheep. They appeared to be traveling upon some type of hard-packed, dusty road or path. They continued to cry out and appeared lost and confused. The cries began to intensify. I saw as they would stop to eat at weeds growing next to the road, and I realized that their cries had intensified because they were hungry. The weeds didn't appear to satisfy the hunger of the wandering sheep. They continued to travel down the hard-packed road, crying out and attempting to eat anything that was growing at the edge of the road. Some of the sheep began to fall at the side of the road. Their cries became weaker and weaker until they were only laying quietly on the side of the road. I saw that these sheep had become completely overcome by their hunger and their weariness. They were totally unresponsive. Come with me, said the Lord. I had come to a halt next to a fallen sheep. 
Quietly the Lord and I proceeded to follow the wounded sheep. I saw as they quickly left the side of the road, I looked to see where they were all running to, and I saw a pasture. The pasture at first glance appeared fertile and lush, but when the Lord and I drew close, I saw it was a fouled pasture. The grass was slimy and trampled down and smelled. Yet the wounded sheep were eating this grass ravishly. Their cries stopped as they tore at the grass and continued to eat at it. After a time, though, the sheep began to cry out. I sensed that these cries were cries of pain. Many of the sheep began to vomit. And they vomited up the rotten grass that they had just been feasting upon. And after they had finished vomiting, they simply fell down in the pasture. After they had fallen down, I saw wolves and other predators begin to steal stealthily into the pasture. They came upon the fallen, wounded sheep and began to devour them. The Lord said to me, Have you understood what you have seen? And I replied, Yes. I felt sickness and despair within my heart. And that's how I witnessed this vision. Then the Lord said, There are many of my children who sit in the congregation with hidden wounds. They are not healed of their wounds. They have concealed their wounds. Their unhealed wounds are separating them from the flock. At times they separate themselves. Other times they are separated from the rest of the flock by the rest of the flock's confusion and anger and frustration towards the behavior of the wounded sheep. They have eaten strange words and perverse doctrines to satisfy their hunger, the Lord continued. At first the words and the doctrines seem to satisfy the terrible gnawing and hunger these wounded sheep were experiencing. But it was strange doctrine and words not from me. They spewed up these words and doctrines and were overcome by their hunger and weariness and became easy prey, easy prey for the predator. Behold, my daughter, the vision is not ended. I then saw the Lord himself approach the fowl pasture and he entered into it. He began to tend to each of the fallen, wounded sheep. I watched as he gently ran his hands over each sheep and spoke quietly, soothingly to the sheep. The Lord then began to leave this fowl pasture. He was calling each of the sheep by name and urging them gently to come follow him. Some of the sheep struggled to their feet and began to follow the Lord. Some of the sheep continued to remain upon the ground. Come with me, the Lord said to me. I began to follow as he led the sheep from the fowl pasture. I felt a soft, cool breeze upon my face and I smelled the clean, fresh scent of grass. I looked further ahead and I saw another pasture. The Lord made his way to this new pasture. He led the sheep into it. I followed close behind. I saw that this pasture was a good pasture. It was clean and rich with lush grass. There was a bubbling stream through this pasture. When the sheep first entered into this new pasture, they did it hesitantly. The Lord led softly and gently and urged the sheep further into the pasture. I saw the sheep begin to graze quietly upon the lush grass or drink from the stream of water. Behold, the Lord said to me, I turned and I looked where the Lord was pointing. I was perplexed to see that some of the sheep were backing away from this new pasture and they were refusing to enter into it. Some of them returned to the fowl pasture. Others simply continued to wander and fall at the edge of the road. All of those who refused to enter into the new pasture were eventually devoured by the predator. The Lord asked me, Do you understand all you have seen? No, I replied. I couldn't understand why some of the sheep had refused to enter into the new pasture. I am the good shepherd, the Lord said. I will search and seek out those of my sheep who have wandered away from the flock. I will heal them and lead them to green pastures and fresh water. Yet there are some who are so fearful they will refuse to allow themselves to be healed. Remember last week we were saying, let not that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be here. You have to, you have to allow yourself to be healed. There has to be something that turns in your heart where you let go of wounds, you let go of a state of being wounded, you stop, stop embracing the state of being wounded, and, and you actually open your heart and allow yourself to be healed. You let down the walls of protection that you have built up, which, like I say, comes with a certain risk. People are reluctant to do it for fear of being wounded again or whatever. But they refuse to allow themselves to be healed or to believe that I am with them. Why is that, I asked the Lord. Desire, the Lord replied. Desire, I repeated. I don't understand what you mean. Those of my children who refuse to be healed and to enter into the pasture where I lead them, the Lord said, 
do so because their desire has died. They have become consumed and overcome with their woundings. I pondered the Lord's word for a moment. How do those whose desire has died get their desire restored? Why they must return unto me with all their heart and soul. Repent, come to Jesus, the Lord said. They must stop looking at everything around them and focus only upon me. It will take time for these sheep, but with patience and compassion, they can be restored once again. I have a question, Lord. Why were those who were wounded not healed in your house? Many reasons. For some of those sheep, they had no idea how to be healed. Their wounds had become their whole entire life and focus. Others were not healed, for they needed the congregation to help heal and restore them. Yet too often, the congregation also had no idea how to help and bring uh, the wounded in, in their midst to full healing and restoration. Their own feelings of inadequacy and helplessness caused many of them to turn with anger and frustration on those that were wounded. And this anger and frustration only caused new wounds for a sheep that was already wounded, which caused further separation of the wounded sheep. This is a day and time, the Lord continued, in the which I will pour out my healing upon my children. A wounded people cannot reap the harvest which is white to be harvested. A wounded people cannot heal. Only those who have been healed or in the process of allowing themselves to be healed can heal others and touch others with my saving grace. Is this vision a rebuke to shepherds, I asked? It is a warning, the Lord replied. The shepherds are to study their sheep and to know them. They can only do this by being with them where they live. The enemy is attacking the unity of the flock by inflicting wounds upon my people or by recalling to remembrance my children's former wounds. I would have the shepherds to be aware of the strategy of the enemy and to seek me for instructions and guidance. And that's the vision of the wounded sheep. So you have wounded sheep, you have others, their own feeling of inadequacy caused them to turn with frustration and anger on already wounded sheep, and it just exasperates the problem. Well, you know, the, there's, there's uh, you know, a, a, a vision is one thing, right? A vision or a dream is one thing, and the Word of God is another, right? What's the chaff to the wheat, the Bible says. But if you can take the vision, the chaff, and if you can take the seed or the wheat, the Word of God, and apply it to the vision and substantiate the vision with the Word of God, well then, the vision isn't chaff anymore, and is, is it? It's, it's, it's actual, it's an embodiment of scriptural principles. So if you notice, when you read this healing and restoration vision, it has certain elements in it that are, run very close parallel to Ezekiel 34. So we'll be going to Ezekiel 34, and comparing that to some of the things that are in this uh, vision. Now, so, in a condition where everyone's so wounded and things are so treacherous and volatile from the sole of the foot to the head, then the exhortation in the uh, vision is that we, the individual, we must focus on Jesus. And we must believe that He is out there calling by name, trying to lead each individual sheep out of their state of being wounded. So on an individual level, that's our part. But as, a, as far as our interaction with each other, any of us who are in the process of being healed or have been healed, then we have to apply ourselves to minister the grace to bring others to healing. And we can't allow vexation and frustration and we can't allow our own sense of being wounded to whatever degree cause us to turn with anger and frustration on others especially if the net result is to further alienate them to inspire more wounds okay and that's this is a okay and this is this is the state of the proverbs when it says the poor oppressing the poor is like a sweeping rain that leaves no food. And a sweeping rain is a rain that is a particularly violent and driven rain. You know, when you have rain and you ask God for rain so it can um, 
Uh, it can water the garden and make our crops grow. And the clouds come and a nice light rain falls. Well, that's ideal, right? Because the water, it's a nice light rain and it's steady. And the plants uh, can gradually take in the nourishment of the rain and drink in the rain that falls oft upon the earth. <laughs> but a sweeping rain is something which is, has a driving driving violent force behind it. It's like, uh, have you ever seen wind and very fierce winds? And it's almost so windy that the rain almost looks like it's going horizontal instead of vertical. It's a sweeping rain. And the rain beats violently down the earth and it strikes the plant and it strikes it and actually, if it's violent enough, a sweeping rain will just knock the plants over. So the poor plants are they're experiencing an exposure to rain, but at the same time, they're getting knocked down all the time. So it's kind of a catch-22. Yeah, there's rain, but yet, is the rain doing any nourishment? The poor plant has to spend all its resources recovering from being knocked over all the time. So it doesn't have a very good result, a sweeping rain. The poor oppressing the poor. And so to a certain, extent, you, a certain extent, the Bible says, blessed is he that considers the poor. You consider the poor. But you know, and this is the, uh, the tragedy of the state of the church the way it is. The treachery of it, the, the poverty of it is that you have the poor oppressing the poor. Somewhere someone has to get healed and then start ministering, healing. And now here's the thing. Jesus said, Behold, I send you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And in this condition, it doesn't take much to do something that seemingly has a harmful or injurious effect. Now, Paul the Apostle, before his conversion, you know, he said... Um, I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. And he said, and I was injurious. I was injurious. Well, brother, that's anybody in authority who hasn't been converted. I don't care where you are in your ministry. I don't care if I've been a teacher for 40 years. There's areas in my heart where I have not been converted and I'm working it out with God. And if I use my authority to stand here and minister and call you out and call you down and cut you down. And I use this uh, pulpit or this authority or this ministry as a platform to rehearse my own sore against you because I'm just sore against you because I just don't like the way you're reacting. I don't like the way you're responding and I'm taking it out on you and I'm doing it under the pretense of exercising my authority over you. But I'm really... It's really a pretense. What I'm really doing is I'm using this platform as a, as a, I'm using my ministry as a platform to rehearse my own sore. To utter my grievance against you. There's, and there's too much, there's, there's a lacking of a spirit of charity that is seeking the healing of the people of God. Then I'm just a poor man, I'm sore. Because I don't like the reaction of people. And I'm oppressing you when you're the poor. I'm the poor oppressing the poor. We're not going to get very far. We're not going to get very far in the operation of God. So that's how that works. Uh, so the poor oppressing the poor. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. As we said before... In oversight, for a lot of the time, overseers spend a lot of time doing nothing. They just take inventory. They are just become diligent to know the state of the flock. They understand the principles of judgment. They are not quick to antagonize, berate, and belittle excessively. We said it over and over again that one of the rules, let's say the criteria of judgment, is that if you're going to beat your brother... Don't beat him above 40 stripes. After 40 stripes, back off. Lest your brother seem vile unto thee. This is what we said before. If you just keep uh, insulting and berating, 
you know, what, what did Jesus said? My Lord, what, what about those who say, my Lord delays his coming? And they begin to be eat and drink with the drunken. They begin to seek their pleasure, get drunken in their pleasure. And they begin to beat the men servants and the maid servants, beat them down. That, that, the Lord will come from that man when he is not looking. And he will appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, with the wicked people, with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as I said before, if you beat with too many stripes, every time you berate and belittle your brother and beat him down with a stripe, a verbal indictment or a verbal insult against him, every time you do that, you are, you are speaking that indictment and you are hearing yourself say it and you are reinforcing the concept in your own mind that your brother can only be evil. And, then after, you act, and that's why you, you have to back off after 40 you, 40 stripes. You can't get excessive and superfluous and repetitive with this. Because in that exercise of beating down your brother and indicting him over and over again with many stripes, you keep convincing himself that that's what he is and that's the only thing he can be. And you become cynical against your brother and he'll only seem vile unto thee. And then you'll hear people say things like that. It's in, it, you are totally incapable of respect. You are totally incapable of knowing a response. Well, that's someone who's concluded that you are totally incapable. It is impossible for you because your brother has now become vile to you and you've cultivated yourself to uh, only be able to think evil of your brother because you dwelt so excessively on the evil and you've exercised and rendered so many excessive stripes upon him that you lose the ability to think anything good about your brother. Now, on that note, what did David say about the people of God? I mean, David, you know, King David said, Surely, God, my goodness extends not to you. Surely, God, my goodness extends to the saints in the earth, to the most excellent, he said, in whom is all your delight. So somewhere in there, there's got to be a balance. Once, once in a while, we have to understand, you know, regardless of where we're at, that the saints of God are God's delight and that he is saving them. All right, so be wise as serpents and... Harmless as doves. We have to apply ourselves to wisdom and be very acutely aware of Satan's strategy, the state of the flock. We don't want to exasperate the state of being wounded. We don't want to cater to the wounds. You know, we don't want people's wounds to dictate how we treat them. You know, God, God has to deal with wounds and things, and then dealing with wounds, you also have to deal with sin and iniquity, but you want to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. You know, the perfect man bridles the tongue. He is, uh, and he does not offend in word. The same is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. So we're seeking out with great deliberation and, and deliberate consciousness in the sight of God uh, what is, is there a way to do this without exasperating the state of others being wounded and without being injurious, without setting back the operation of God? All right, you know, people can be in denial about certain things and sometimes it's not the time to talk about, uh, call them out on things because they may get defensive and go into a deeper denial. Like, that's just the way people are. There is a certain time and place to do all this stuff, but there's a way to do this that we got to bring ourselves back from the state of being wounded and we can't uh, be rash about it. It's just when people are wounded, you have to go delicately sometimes. You have to go with carefulness. But that's it. It's like I said, if you got a sore shoulder and I pat you on the back, well, I'm... I've wounded you. I've caused you to feel pain and you might lash out at me because you're, you're, you're in a wounded state. Well, if I already know you're in a wounded state and I know your, your shoulder is wounded, then uh, I'll just leave that shoulder alone and I'll shake your hand. Maybe I'll do that instead. Right? But we just can't be nonchalant and uh, just have to be aware of this because 
the tricky part of this is, uh, as is revealed in the vision, well, the people don't always appear like they're wounded. Sometimes on the outward appearance, they appear to be okay, but the wounds are hidden wounded, hidden, hidden wounds. They're, they're hidden underneath layers of scar tissue, so they're not always apparent. And people have a way of doing that, glossing over, covering over. Uh, and there's the whole work of dissembling when you show yourself as one being in one state, but actually you're in another. You, you dissemble. And so there's all of those issues that have to be considered about how we are, where we're at as the people of God. But anyway, be as wise as a serpent and be as harmless as a dove. All right. So let's go now to um, Ezekiel 34. And we'll read through that and make... You'll see the comparisons. So what's going on here is, uh, here's what we're looking at and looking for. We're looking for a reaching out of Jesus himself, the Holy Ghost, the chief shepherd. He says, I, even I, in Ezekiel 34, even I, even I, Jesus himself, even I, even I will both search and seek out my sheep. I will go to them individually. I'll send the Holy Ghost and I'll reach out to them individually, one by one. You know, I, my sheep know my voice. I call them by name, and it's in the vision here. He started calling each sheep by name and gently wooing. Okay, because a lot of people have completely lost their trust in the administration of God through men, the administration of God through uh, men of authority. They've been in toxic spiritual situations where the men of authority are so in denial of evil and so misusing and misrepresenting their authority and serving themselves and have been so disillusioned by that demonstration of authority that they're very reluctant to, see, to receive anything from authority of God that's through a man. So God says, if that's the case, if that's what the case shape you're in, the state you're in, and you're one of my sheep, I'm going to have to search and seek out my sheep. I'm, I'm going to have to come to you. This is what we're looking for. I've talked to Christopher about it, and I tell him how after I came out of a toxic spiritual environment, I was very afraid because I was separating from a, a scenario where I was in a congregation of God's people with regular access to demonstration of the Holy Ghost, and I was going off all by myself, living in a hotel room somewhere, and all I knew for the short term was I was going to be fixing toilets at hotels. And that was a pretty scary prospect for me, you know. Yeah. Is that the end of the teacher? Just <laughs> Well, anyway, through those times, I had personal visitations from the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost would show me things and tell me things and sucker me and encourage me and try to heal my soul and quell my fears and heal my wounds. And I'm still, I'm still volatile at times, but I've come a long way. Compared to what that was a number of years ago, I guess 2016 or 17, I don't remember right now off the top of my head. But this is what we look for. Look for it. Look for an influence of the Holy Ghost, God reaching out to you in your circumstances, or whether His presence falls upon you, or whether He actually speaks directly to your conscience. There's various different ways that God makes it known that He is zeroing in on you personally. Because we have to somehow find a each one of us a personal focus on that manifestation of Jesus Christ that God is giving to us as individuals where He's trying to work out healing. He's trying to pour in the oil and the wine, have compassion and minister so that we don't get um, perplexed and embittered and motivated to further separate ourselves and continue putting up those walls and reject all forms of God reaching out to us through other men. And this is the tragedy. This is why overseers like us have the greater condemnations. Be not many masters, James said, because we will receive the greater condemnation. If we do something that the devil can capitalize on, some error, 
or some selfish act and we feed ourselves instead of the flock and it falls out to the flock having uh, reluctance and a lack of confidence to trust in the working of God through men and they close their hearts off to it so that other men of God can't even have access to them. Well then, brother, that's affecting God's flock. That's messing with God's heritage. That's driving some kind of a breach and wedge between God and His people, giving occasion. And you can say all you want to, all, all those people shouldn't be so easily offended. But wait a minute, they're sheep. They're sheep. And they're weak sheep. They're wounded sheep. They're sheep that only have a certain amount of degree and an ability to resist and reject all that hardness. So like I said before, yeah, there's a, there's a responsibility for us for not letting our hearts get hardened, and there's a, a responsibility on the side of authority not to do anything to give Satan an advantage or give any occasion that the ministry can be blamed in any way. And therefore, the ministry receives the greater condemnation, the greater degree of judgment and penalty for messing things up because of their position and the more profound of an effect that it has. And that's just cause and effect. I'm not trying to threaten anybody, but this is, uh, this is what the Bible says. It's like we said before, you know, if doctors want to uh, be accredited and if they want the honor and the accolades for operating on somebody and saving their life, you know, they operate and the person doesn't die, and they want to be praised, wow, we saved their life. You know, the, well, how about when you operate and the person dies? Are you willing to take credit for their death? But no, that, that's, that's not how it works in the medical profession. You know, you go in and you sign a disclaimer that waives them of any responsibility if anything bad happens. But it's not like that in the kingdom of God. It's not like that. Okay? You know, men of God want to take claim, uh, honor, and uh, accolades from the people that we are the ones that are bringing you the words of salvation. Okay? All right. So, because of our words, you can follow on to be saved. And that's supposed to be an honor to the man of God. But how about if the man of God does things that cause the sheep to be harden and go astray? Would you care to take credit for that as well? Instead of always dumping it on the sheep, blaming them for being offended, when it's woe by whom the offense cometh? Jesus placed no onus of blame on the, 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 the lesser sheep who were offended. Woe be unto the world because of offenses. Woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Yet yeah, woe unto your worldly old man that you let show out in your flesh that caused offense to the people of God. That's, we have to fear that stuff. We have to fear offending one another. Now we can't go around in pins and needles and let the fear of offending one another keep us from making a stand on the word of God or anything. You know how that works. But what I'm saying is, yeah, we should be afraid of offending one another. We're all we're God's people. Touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. Prophets doesn't want anybody to do them any harm on the basis of that scripture, but then we're God's anointed. Don't touch us either when we're in the will of God. You know, if I'm standing and I stand by faith. You say what you will, but I'm like Joshua the high priest, and I'm standing before the Lord, and I'm in the exercise of my office, and I'm in the will of God doing it. I, I'm God's anointed. All right. Well, where is charity in all this? You see, charity is so sorely lacking in all of this. So sorely lacking. Uh, <coughs> we have cut people down and uh, presumptuously write them off and cut them off and curse them and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's a, I have a whole teaching on that. When, when do we actually uh, pray cursing or whatever on God's people? There's a long, long procedure. You know, David said, I hate the enemies of the Lord. I hate them with a righteous hatred. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that took place before he got to that. Well, that's another message. Anyway, let me get to Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. 
Prophesy, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, you clothe you with the will, you kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The disease have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which is broken, neither have you brought again that which is driven away. Hear that? Driven away. And we hear lots of things about how, how God took them all out of here. And yet, no, some of these people were driven away. And do you hear about people say, you see how they all went away? And, uh, well, I went away because I was in a situation where God told me to do that. And we, we quoted the scripture before in, in Timothy. Right? You know, the, the book of Timothy. And these are they that lead captive silly women laden with sins, so on and so forth. And he goes through all the, the stuff and he says, uh, they have a form of godliness. They deny the power of thereof by just continuously living in their sin, willingly, presumptuously, with presumptuous provisional exercise, abuse of their authority and calling. The Bible says, from such, turn away. Have no fellowship with those unfruitful works of darkness. Don't be a partaker with that man's sins. But they'll say, God has rejected us and given up on us. And Well, wait a sec. Wait a sec. There's more to it than that, you see. How about those who have been driven away? And when I talk about restoration, 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, the Bible says in the restoration, all the vessels of the Lord... Now, on that day, it was talking about the golden and silver vessels that were in the temple. But that represents the gold and silver saints of God who have hearts, who have the gold of God in their hearts, and the righteousness of God, okay? The elect of God are the vessels of gold and silver. So in those days, uh, the vessels of gold and silver that were carried away into Babylon, all those vessels of gold and silver which were restored, which King Ahaz, in his transgression, cast away. King Ahaz was in transgression as a result of his transgression. He cast away actual vessels of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they went into Babylon. And in the restoration, all those golden vessels were restored back to the house of God. But why did they go? Why did those vessels go? Because God cursed them and took them out of the temple? No, because King Ahaz, in his transgression cast them away, drove them away, drove them out. And what, what about his transgression made him do that? Because in his transgression, he was feeding himself. He was not feeding the flock. Feeding himself. They were scattered, okay? Neither, neither have you uh, brought that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty, have you ruled them? Remember we talked about Hophni and Phinehas? In the days of Hophni and Phinehas, the priest's custom that was when any man would do sacrifice and he was boiling the meat, the priest's servant would come and said, Give the priest flesh to eat. And they would say, Well, just wait until it's boiled and sodden and wait until it's properly prepared like the law tells us to. Till it's prepared. You know, till it's properly prepared and take as much as you want. And the priest says, No. Thou shalt give me raw flesh, and you'll give it to me now, and if you don't give it to me now, I'll take it by force. See? So the sin of the men was very grievous before the Lord, and because of that, men began to abhor the offering of the Lord. Because whenever they came to present themselves in the offering of the Lord, they were met with this confrontational priest who was trying to get raw, raw flesh out of them before the process, before the time. Right? And some people try to get reaction out of the people. They try to get response out of the people. And they want it instantly. They want it out of raw flesh. And some of the people are, well, hey, why don't you just wait, wait. Please wait until we go through process. And, and it's a natural, a genuine sacrifice. The priest says, no, you give it to me now. Give me the raw flesh. So you can't force a sacrifice out of raw flesh. Never can you get righteousness out of raw flesh. And if you're not getting it, you can't force the issue. You can't force the issue. That becomes a very grievous sin. That's part of the sin of Hophni and Phinehas in the book of Samuel. 
With force and cruelty you've ruled them. They were scattered because there is no shepherd. They became meat to all the beasts of the field. You hear that? So they're driven out. They're kicked out. Not only that, but they're accused that they have forsaken God and left. When they haven't forsaken God and left. Or at least many of them haven't forsaken God and left. They've been driven out. King Ahaz in his transgression has cast them away. And yet they're being slandered at the same time. Force and cruelty. And what happens is you're left out in this world, driven away from the congregation, driven away from the fellowship. Another scripture that goes with this is Diotrephes. Diotrephes, loving to have preeminence among them, uh, forbids them to have fellowship with the brethren and casts out those of them who would. Well, and you can go on and on. But they were scattered because there is no shepherd and they became meat to the beasts of the field. Now, in this uh, vision of the wounded sheep, I'm trying to see if I can see where that was. Um, as they began to wander from the uh, fold to the side to the road and all of that stuff, there's nothing but foul pastures for them. And yet they're so hungry, they just gobbled up whatever came their way and it made them sick. And now in the meantime, you see what's happening is that the sheep are driven away and then they're away from the fold and they become subject and they become a prey to every beast of the field, every unclean spirit, every uh, heart-hardening counsel takes advantage of the situation and tries to harden them further. They become meat, a prey to all the spiritual beasts, unclean spiritual beasts of the world that are out there. And so, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. My flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, all you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, and they that, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. And that's what the vision said. Jesus himself began to visit all the individual sheep and began to call them by name and call softly to them. I, even I, Jesus said, this is what's going to happen because of the terrible, volatile, treacherous situation that the body is in. It's state of woundedness from the sole of the foot to the top of the head. And when the shepherds are found feeding themselves, speaking of themselves, magnifying themselves in excess, using the works of their ministry to pursue their lusts and fulfill them. They're feeding themselves. They can say all they want to, they're not, but they are. So, God is going to require it. And God is not going to let this condition continue. He's going to make sure that, that the flock will be delivered from their mouth and they're not going to be meat for their sin and their iniquity. And to feed themselves. Thus saith the Lord God. Behold even I even I will both search my sheep. And seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock. In the day that he is among his sheep. That are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep. And will deliver them. Out of all places where they have been scattered. In the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people. And gather them from the countries. And will bring them to their own land. And feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall, shall their fold be. See how it bears resemblance to the vision here? How Jesus was trying to bring those sheep, and he eventually led some of them to a good pasture? And that's what Jesus is going to do. <coughs> you know, I'll give them pastures which shall feed them after my own heart. And God's going to bring you to... People who will preach, and they'll preach the uh, 
the true word of, word of God. It will convict. It will challenge. It will um, uh, spur us on to go on to perfection. It will reprove us of sin and iniquity and all so forth, but it will also cleanse. It will heal us. It will not drive us away. And it will establish our hearts again and bring healing. The people of God do need to be healed. And like I say, not a slight healing, but we do need to be healed. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. If it is all possible, as much as lies in you, search and seek out the way, if it's possible, to be peaceable with all men. And use that, prefer that, try that first. It's not always going to be 100%. It's impossible that offenses will come. The ministry is going to somehow be an offense one way or another. It's inevitable. But we, we don't want to be injurious in excess. And we don't want to be, uh, miss out on the wisdom of God. We want to make sure that we do not contribute to the strategy of Satan Knowingly or, or whatever, you know. We don't want to knowingly contribute to the strategy of Satan. We don't want to take a wounded sheep and minister more wounding and further separation. And it's just going to be a longer journey back for them. I will feed them in a good pasture upon the high mountains of Israel. Shall their fold be there? Sh there shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost. I will bring again that which was driven away. No, not God. Yeah, well, not that God took them out because he's ready to curse them and he's angry at them. No, they were driven away. And I will bind up that which is broken. I will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. Who among us and adulterers God will judge. As for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the ram and the he-goats. Now I, here's how I read this, and you can... Tell me if you think it's not right, but I, I, this is how I've always read this. God turns now with this perspective, and he says, As for you, O my flock, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the ram and the he-goats. You know, we all have rank and hierarchy and everything else. We talk about that, right? There's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and then there's the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of governments and helps and and you go on down the line, and there's a hierarchical structure, and there's authority, and you look in the church, and while this fellow has a very high stand here, and this one is very much lower on the uh, hierarchy, and, and yet all of those positions and power and uh, the giving out of authority and the expression of authority and power is God working through the body, and God sets up who He will, and He gives whatever gift He, he gives according severally as He wills, not as we will. And so really, without the uh, anointing of God and without the ordination of God and the unction of God and the approval of God and uh, the cooperation of God and the gift of God, what are we compared to each other any more than just a bunch of <laughs> you know, sinful people that God chose? Really, if you take away the, what God has made us, nobody differs from anybody else. So God can look down and He doesn't matter whether you're the highest apostle or whether you're the lowest saint, you're all a bunch of cattle. Yeah. Your hierarchy means nothing to him. Because he's the one operating in the authority, and he's the one who has not given as much to the least saint that is out there. So to God, we're all the same that way, in a way. And, and, and in the sense that God doesn't respect persons. God isn't going to respect the persons of the mighty, because his mightiness is what God put on him. He's no different than the lowest saint. Now, as for you, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the ram and the he-goats. Don't care if you're an apostle, don't care if you're the lowest saint. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and you've drunk the deep waters, but you foul the residue with your feet. Vision, they were drinking foul waters, muddy, slimy <laughs> pastures. 
As for my flock, they eat that which you trodden down with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Therefore thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and the lean cattle. Okay, obviously the fat cattle are the ones who are fat because they fed themselves. The lean cattle are the ones who have been driven away. Because you have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey. I will judge between cattle and cattle. And I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them, even my servant David. This is the type of Jesus Christ. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with him a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them, the places round about my hill, a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in a season, and there shall be showers of blessings. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hands of those that serve themselves off of them. Well, people like to think we've been, take God has took us out, or we've been taken out of the way. Well, really, God has delivered us from those that are just going to serve themselves off of our a righteous servitude. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plant a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither shall bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the God, and you, my flock, the flock of my pasture are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Well, that's the... So here's the chaff, the, the uh, vision of the wounded sheaf. That's the chaff. And the wheat that goes with it is Ezekiel chapter 34. You, you can see there's very much parallels there. So you can see this vision has a very, very much a very uh, legitimate scriptural pattern uh, imagery to it. So that becomes very easy to take the vision and take the scripture and tag it to the vision. So what's the chaff to the wheat? Well, we've got the chaff and the wheat. So it just enhances the wheat and reinforces it, illustrates it better. All right. Is this a vision to rebuke the shepherds in the vision? You see that? Well, I'll go one step further and say, yeah, it is. It's a rebuke to shepherds. Woe to the shepherds that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Okay, now let's take this to... All right. Um... Well, I'm going to read some scriptures in Isaiah. Uh, part of the reason I do this is, uh, you know, people that we know have come out of situations and they've been sorely challenged. I mean, their actual status of election with God has been put in question and slandered some people very, very strongly, very consistently. And to a certain extent, we got to talk like this and show these things to the point where, where we can at least hold our confidence. So, so I'll just warn myself and warn everybody else. This stuff is not meant to stir up ill feelings against other people. But you do have to expose it to the point to convince people. You, you know, the ministry has a job to confirm the souls of the disciples. When a person, other person has been feeding themselves and wrongfully driving people out of churches and stuff, and then not only that, but, you know, breathing out cursing and slander and everything else, then something has to come by that can help confirm the souls of people who are being wrongfully accused. We have to fight to hold our confidence, but we have to fight uh, without being bitter and malicious about it, but nevertheless, 
To a certain extent, that means we have to expose what's going on, reprove the lie of it, so that we can hold on to our own integrity and righteousness that we possess with God, because it is being challenged. We have to hold our peace. This has to minister to the people of God that are, that are in such a scenario, such a situation, so that their souls can be confirmed, so it can still their souls and, and bring them and maintain them in a place of confidence towards God. And that's what it means. Paul exhorted the souls of the, the confirmed and exhorted the souls of the disciples, right? He confirmed them. He spoke words that confirmed they were the people of God. And he exhorted them how that through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. Now, here's a scripture that is a, a comfort to me. And it's the greatest comfort to me when I'm not looking for it and the Lord gives it to me. Now, <laughs> the Lord has, has given this to me when I wasn't looking for it. And then since then, I've often thought of it for comfort. <laughs> but uh, I'm looking for it. Oh. Yeah, so that's Isaiah 66. Um, Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake. They said, let the Lord be glorified. But he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. Again, I, I don't mean this as a threat or anything. This is the word of God. I've, uh, I don't know how long it was, was ago. I remember when I prayed on the uh, preached on the prayer of Hannah. Yeah. The thing about the prayer of Hannah is, uh, you know, prayer of Hannah talks about how God can flip things around 180 degrees. You know, don't. I think she starts the prayer of Hannah to, uh, in there is talk no more uh, exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. It's one thing we don't want to do. We don't want to talk proudly and arrogantly in a way that curses other people who are the known people of God. You know, just because we're sore that they didn't go along with you and because you were in your, your like King Ahaz in your transgression. You don't want to talk exceedingly proudly. Let not God, arrogancy come out of your mouth for the for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions. actions are weighed. Actions are weighed. And then it goes on to say, now look at this, the, the bows of the mighty men are broken. And the poor little underlings that are stumbling around, all wounded and stumbling around, God healed them and girded them up with strength. Right. So the mighty men get weak, and the weak men get mighty. And God changes the standard and flip, turns the tables. Why? Because of pride and arrogancy. You know, don't talk proud. Don't let arrogancy come out of your mouth. And this is the astounding thing about the darkness that's in some men's conscience. The, the, the sheer, utter, total darkness of conscience, the seeredness of conscience, that people can rail and rally and wax confident. You know, we've also talked about how for every attribute of God, there's a corresponding counterfeit attribute of the devil. You know, for instance, the righteous are as bold as a lion. So a man may speak full of a bu bunch of confidence. But then again, a fool rages and is confident. So if you're righteous, you're bold as a lion. But if you're righteous, let me tell you, you're speaking with some kind of scriptural authority and substance. And as I said before, if all you're doing is hurtling, threatenings, and cursings and insults at people with no kind of scriptural substance behind it, no other sort of evidence or any other righteous support behind your utterances of so-called judgment, then you're just beating the air. You're just raging and you're faking your confidence. You're putting forth a confidence. But what was the... Was it Jeremiah? Anyway, it's, I think it was in Jeremiah where God says, The Lord hath rejected your confidences, and you're not going to prosper in those kinds of conf confidences. Okay, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless 
It's not going to come. Yeah, don't hold your breath trying to curse God's elect because they, they walked out on your wicked works. You know, and They obeyed the Holy Ghost when the Holy Ghost said, from such turn away. When the Holy Ghost said, no, you can't be a partaker of that, supposing it's the Apostle Paul himself. And you, you have a bunch of people who are bold enough and brave enough to sit the Word of God as a higher authority than a man with a bunch of threatenings, contrary to the Word of God, in violation of holiness, you know, profaning, while profaning the holiness of God, while transgressing all the principles of grace, and feeding himself and carrying on an excessive provisional sin. So it's not going to happen. We're not going to be cursed because of that. Now, if we get cursed, it might be because of something else, but not because of that. <laughs> not because of that. So I seek to confirm the souls of the disciples. To lay it out and make it clear. These are the things which are in error in the church, even amongst those in authority. And when authority can, does A, B, C, and D, and excess, and an error to grace, and everything else, and you decide you don't want to be a partaker of that, you are in your integrity according to the Word of God, according to the Spirit of God. Okay, so that then what happens is the Spirit of glory and grace should rest upon us. Okay, they speak evil of us. Right? They that cast us out, that hated us, said, Let the Lord be glorified. Let those wicked people, God, take them out of here. But Isaiah said, if we're in our integrity, if we're in our integrity, Isaiah said, the Lord will appear to our joy. He'll give us joy, showing us, yes, we, we did the right thing. We stood on true holiness. We esteemed the Word of God. Yeah, and we were willing to suffer shame and reproach and put our whole callings and reputations with our other brothers and sisters on the line because we knew it was such a serious and grave situation about the holiness of God and we were very sincere about that intent, that motivation behind us. Okay, And we were not, as we were accused of being, trying to bring down men of God or take his place or take over his ministry and all, all, those, all those other accusations that were coming up. Anyway... But we do need to be healed, folks. We do need to be healed. And we have to let ourselves be healed. And maybe I'll pick this up next week. Uh, but um, just to sort of touch on it, to whet your appetite sort of thing, give you something to think about maybe through the week. Um, sometimes the reasons we're not, wounded, we're not healed is because we embrace our wounds. Uh, we hold on to them. And uh, we can talk about that later. Um, so we have to be ready to uh, let ourselves be healed and be ready to open up ourselves. And we have to be looking for that personal visitation and administration of Jesus himself, the Holy Ghost, like Ezekiel 34 said. He said, I, even I, will both search and seek out my sheep. He, he had to do that because the flock was scattered. So he has to go out and seek out each individual one. The Lord's calling. The Holy Ghost, I mean. I mean, I'm, I'm talking past a preaching or anything like that. I'm saying the Holy Ghost to your heart. He's calling you by name. If you're one of the scattered ones, the driven out ones, He's reaching out to you. You've got to connect with that. He's calling you by name. He wants to heal you. He wants to come in there and have compassion and begin to slowly convince you to open your heart again, draw you back into the fold, bring you perhaps to other Christians, other ministers, people who can minister healing to you. And there has to be a restoration to the body of Christ. Like, like, the, like the lady said in the vision, uh, a wounded congregation cannot bring forth the harvest. We've got to be healed. We've got to be healed. So let it rather be healed. All right. God bless you. That's it.